Wow, thank you all for those wonderful uh, presentations this morning. Just um, <clears throat> terrific and remarkably good examples of how data linkages can help to improve the evidence base for caring for uh, older individuals. <clears throat> uh, we're going to uh, launch into the panel discussion. We have about 40 minutes all together uh, for that. I want to remind all the uh, participants who are viewing the meeting to please put your comments and questions uh, using the public uh, chat feature. We will try to get to as many of those as we can. I see we already have some appearing in the chat. <clears throat> uh, we have two special guests that we've invited to the panel along with the presenters today, and I'm going to briefly introduce each of them. Their bios are included in the briefing book, and ask each of them in turn to give us about five minutes of reflection from their perspectives uh, on the use of post-market data uh, in um, examining uh, outcomes for older individuals. So uh, first is uh, Lisa Hess, who is Senior Research Advisor at Eli Lilly and Company, and she will be followed by Neil Maripol, who is Vice President and Head of Medical and Scientific Affairs at Flatiron Health. So, Lisa, uh, let's hear your uh, reflections on on and your thoughts about what you've heard in this in this session so far. Will do. Thank you. Thanks for having me as part of this panel. Um, you know, just briefly, I, I know I was introduced. I, I did want to mention I have a appointment also at Indiana University. Um, I have former academic, like many of us are, and everything I say is my own opinion, not of any organization. But I'm I'm grateful to share an industry perspective um, from my own point of view. So one of the things that really stood out to me is really the value of incorporating real world data in com companionship with clinical trials. I think there's a complementary role there that is really underutilized, particularly when it comes to populations that tend to be underrepresented in clinical trials, such as the older adult. And, and what I'd like to um, throw out on the table here for potential discussion are there that the missing opportunities we have between um, industry, academia, and community practice settings is really we have opportunities, I believe, to pool our uh, resources, um, and I'm talking technical expertise and our backgrounds to really push the science forward a bit farther. Um, some of the ideas I have about um, such uh, partnerships um, could involve a, a variety of models. And I'll give a couple of examples of, of how I think this could work and how it has worked in the past. I think as a prior academic, and many of us in industry are uh, really uh, data nerds, prior academics and healthcare professionals who really um, have a passion for improving health outcomes. You know, one way we could do this potentially um, is um, an example I have right now is with MD Anderson, with Drs. Shelley Wong and Charlie Cleland. We're doing a prospective study where we're looking at patient reported outcomes combined with electronic medical records in the setting of older patients with gastric cancer who either do not enroll the clinical trials or are not eligible for it. Um, in this setting, um, we're working together as co-PIs, Drs. Wang and I, and the data are being collected and analyzed at MD Anderson. That's one potential model of a collaborative research project. Another idea, I'm working with uh, Drs. Bruno and Patel at Case Western University Hospital, where it's kind of a different model, where on our side, um, we're co-PIing again to investigate disparities in the access to genomics testing and clinical trial enrollment. And what we're doing here is that um, on our side, we have access to a number of both public and proprietary databases. So we're investigating this issue across multiple solid tumors using the resources that we have access to at our organization. So um, in this case, the analytics are being done on our side, but in both cases, um, the research design, um, research question and methodologies are being done together. I know I only have a couple minutes, so just one more quick example, and then I will turn it over to the rest of the panel to do their introductory remarks. Another example is with uh, Dr. Tom Abrams at Harvard University. We've had a series of projects together um, where we use both models. Sometimes the analytics are done on their side, sometimes ours. But I would say that um, to move the science forward for the older adult, these types of models could be further pursued uh, to pool the, the resources. There's a lot of smart people on both sides that really, if we work together, I think we can do great work. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you so much, Lisa. Um, I'm sure we'll come back to touch on some of those uh, issues during the panel discussion. Uh, let me turn it over to uh, Neil Maripol for a few remarks. Thank you very much. And, and many thanks to the National Academies and Drs. Shulsky and Oyer for inviting me to participate uh, in this panel. 
Um, my lens, as, as you heard earlier, is uh, that of somebody who, who works in a, a health tech company. Um, I'm an oncologist, an oncology researcher, um, and we are focused on uh, improving cancer care through the curation of real world data uh, derived from electronic health records. Um, and so I'd like to, to amplify a little bit on some of the comments we've heard earlier in this session uh, around the ways in which electronic health record derived data um, is well suited um, to exploring outcomes in the post-marketing setting, particularly in rare populations that are underrepresented in clinical trials, such as, as older patients with cancer. Um, as we heard earlier, electronic health records are in some ways a great uh, resource uh, because of their recency, the ability to, to have a longitudinal uh, record of, of individual patients. The, the, the data are very uh, deep and, and broad. Um, and you have the ability to assess the effectiveness in routine clinical practice after a drug is tested in prospective clinical trials. However, um, in doing so, it's really important to, to understand whether an electronic health record data source is fit for purpose for the particular questions in mind, um, and whether it's representative of the broader population of interest, um, this really, these factors really bear on uh, whether the results you, you see in uh, uh, such a, a post-marketing evaluation are generalized bill to the, the population of interest, in this case, older patients uh, with, with cancer. So in terms of uh, fitness for purpose. Um, one of the, the big post-marketing uh, objectives is, is often understanding adverse events uh, in, uh, with newly marketed uh, agents. And, um, and the question is whether these can be reliably assessed um, using electronic health record uh, data uh, based on what is in essence, routine documentation uh, in the course of, of, of routine clinical care. And we've heard earlier that, that claims data um, have certain utility, um, but are often incomplete um, uh, and uh, for, for capturing certain types of, of events. Um, and the question really is, let's say you're interested in immune related uh, adverse events. Are these adverse events well documented, well documented in in routine clinical care, um, and so we've we've tried to dissect out the dimensions uh, of a particular adverse event that might bear on whether the the data source is fit for purpose. Um, so, for example, the the documentation in electronic health records is much better um, as uh, when you're considering events that are expected, that are severe, uh, that are clinically actionable, because these are the things that, that physicians document, um, and also objective uh, measures like laboratory tests or physical findings. But when these features are not present, say the patient reports a side effect that is not uh, common or or it may be moderate and not severe, doesn't require action. These may not be, may, they may be important, but not necessarily captured. So it's important to assess for the, the outcomes of the interest, whether electronic health record data are, are fit. Um, the, the actual feasibility and reliability of the data, you know, can't be assumed um, and really should be formally tested before undertaking uh, the, the, the experiment, uh, if you will, um, and assess whether um, you, you can obtain the information from structured data alone or whether this requires a human abstraction or applications of artificial intelligence, such as machine learning, um, or linkage with, with claims data to, to augment what's otherwise present in the electronic health record. Um, just a, a, a note on representativeness. Um, it's not only the dis distribution of age, how many patients you have that are 
older than 75 years, years for example. Um, but what about comorbidities and socioeconomic status, social determinants of health, um, sites of care, all of which bear on the outcomes in a particular population? And, and we know that not all older patients are the same. Um, this has been well described in the literature of geriatric assessments, but as Dr. Miller mentioned, these are not routinely conducted or documented uh, in routine clinical care. So I wanna sort of leave with uh, a thought, uh, and, and maybe this is a challenge, um, and that is, might we develop new predictive models um, that can help stratify the older population based on uh, structured data in the electronic health record, which is very rich, um, in conjunction perhaps with unstructured data uh, obtained through artificial intelligence, machine learning applications, to develop uh, a measure among the patients uh, who fit into the older age groups, uh, a measure of say their frailty, their likelihood of having an, an adverse uh, outcome. Um, and perhaps this could move the field forward um, in terms of rather than requiring additional documentation for physicians that might bear on their workflow and, and historically folks are resistant to doing, but using the information that's already documented for routine clinical care um, to help us improve care uh, and select uh, treatments for patients in the future. And I'll, I'll, I'll leave with that. Thank you, Neil. Um, well, you certainly touched on a whole bunch of important issues. And um, you know, I think uh, I'm gonna try to dig into a few of them with the uh, panel members. Um, just so, again, wanna remind the audience to please submit any questions that you might have. But to start with, uh, let, me, let me throw out a question really that I hope several other panel members will, will comment on, uh, which seems to me to be the core issue in using any of these post-marketing data sources. And Neil touched on it with respect to the whole issue of you know, fitness for purpose. Uh, Deb Schrag reminded us that uh, post-market data, observational data is not clinical trial data. So really the core question is, how good is it? How good is it to inform clinical decisions, regulatory decisions, practice guidelines, payer policies? Can we rely on it? Um, uh, you know, we've heard a lot about the limitations uh, of these various data sources, data missingness, lack of data standards, confounding bias. So I, I wonder if um, those of you on the panel who work with these large observation data sets all the time can talk a little bit more about what procedures and safeguards can be put in place to be sure that the observations we make, the inferences we draw, um, are sufficiently robust to actually inform decision making by you know any interested party that wants to use this information. Um, so who, who wants to bite on that one first? So I, I'm I'm happy to at least start the discussion. This is Dawn. Um, in terms of you know ultimately the answer you get is totally related on the question you know, on the question that you ask. And you have to make sure that the question that you ask of the data is something that the data can answer. And that sounds sort of obvious, but um, we, you know, I'm sure everybody on this panel has read many, many papers, reviewed many papers where the assumptions made um, are above and beyond what the capabilities of the data um, are. And the more, um, you know, the, the more assumptions you make in the analytic plan, um, the more, you know, variable the, the data outcomes can be. So if you are looking at outcomes that involve a procedure, um, if you're looking at, you know, uh, outcomes that involve an admission uh, to the hospital or something very concrete, then I think you can feel fairly confident in observational data. If you're talking about symptoms like fatigue or a symptom that may not be coded by uh, a provider as regularly, then I think you have for toxicities and other kinds of outcomes, you have to be a little bit more suspect uh, in terms of the, the, the results from those trials. And 
at the end of the day, it also very much depends on the quality of the, the statistical analysis in terms of really being able to control for any confounding. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and just add, I think, you know, in some ways it's, um, it's not that different from, you know, looking at good clinical trial data as well, right? You know, I mean, I'm, if, if the outcome of interest has, isn't there, then you're not going to have, you know, and I'm thinking about some of the work, Don, that you did with early on with aromatase inhibitors, those clinical trials didn't actually prospectively capture some of the symptoms that were important to patients on those therapies because we, you know, we didn't know what we didn't know. And so, you know, I think it's it's important regardless of the data source you're using to be clear up front, you know, about, um, you know, are, are there ways of validating whether or not you're really capturing what's of interest to the to the patients and clinicians and decision makers. And obviously, I, I mean, I would say you know, following a hierarchy of evidence, right? So if you have really good randomized controlled trial data that includes the population of interest and includes the, the outcomes of interest, then that's your gold standard. But, um, you know, it, using other, um, other clinical trial designs or study designs, um, you know, not, dis not deciding to make a, a, a decision based on no data because the quality of the data that you have available isn't, you know, maybe perfect, you know, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good enough. And, and, and I'll follow. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, um, you know, what I really hear everybody saying so far <clears throat> is, um, you know, you can't just jump into a big data set. You have to have a pre-specified set of objectives or hypotheses. You have to have a pre-specified analysis plan just like you were designing a randomized clinical trial. You know, it's it, in a sense, the, the difference is that um, you know what the data can give you at the beginning of your study. Uh, whereas, you know, with an RCT, you don't know what the data is gonna give you until the end of the study. Um, but um, I, I heard, uh, I think I heard Deb uh, wanting to make a comment and maybe Bob Miller. Yeah, Bob, you go ahead first. Yeah, this is Bob. I was I was going to uh, go back to the you know fit for purpose expression, which we we use over and over again. And you know, Rich, you you enumerated three very different purposes: clinical care. I mean, more than three, but you know, the, these kind of data sources can be used for clinical care, for regulatory decision making, and for policy. And I guess I would submit that you know those are very different purposes. You know, they all require high quality data because the decision is important uh, to someone. But just focusing for a second on clinical care, I, I guess I would submit that um, uh, as a way of seeing signals in big data, um, when, you, when you think about learning something from these data sources that you simply have no other way of learning, if you're looking for a rare combination of diagnoses and patient age and therapeutics and lab values, um, you, you may be more willing to accept the ambiguity to at least to have some insight if you're trying to make some decision about uh, treating a specific patient. I mean, again, the patient has to be part of the shared decision-making of that. So they understand that if you're saying, you know, the outcome in, in, in cancer link or flat iron or other data set um, that, that came out of this, um, you know, it's different than what's in uh, an ASCO or an NCCN guideline. But I, I think when you're faced with the uh, alternate being no data at all to sometimes make clinical decisions, um, sometimes, um, the the purpose that you're using it for, you're you're you may be more willing to accept some ambiguity as opposed to something that is um, using data to uh, affect a policy change that's going to uh, affect thousands and, and th millions of of people potentially or or a regulatory decision. You know, again, not to diminish the uh, critical importance of making individual medical decisions on the best evidence you have, but oftentimes you have no evidence. Yeah, the thing that always bothers me, and then I'll, I'll ask Deb for her comment. Um, it frankly is, uh, while I don't disagree with what you're saying, Bob, um, you know, bad data or bad inferences uh, is, it can be worse than no data, right? It can be dangerous. Uh, sure. And if you have a, 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 an inference that is not reproducible and reliable and you use it to, uh, you know, rewrite a clinical practice guideline or make a payer policy or, you know, a regulatory decision that then influences the care of, you know, potentially millions of people, 
uh, you, you know, there's really a risk of doing a lot more harm than good. So that's why, you know, I, I struggle personally a lot with, um, you know, what is the level of evidence that should be available from these kinds of post-market data sets uh, b before one acts on them. Um, Deb, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, so Rich, thank you. So I want to um, tackle this question. It's, I guess, the fit for purpose. I want to talk about clinical decision making at the bedside. And I want to do that by talking about a specific example of a patient who I saw the week before Christmas. So this is, um, his first name is Paolucci. He's an immigrant from Sicily, lives in the north end of Massachusetts and has worked as a car mechanic. And he came in with his daughter, right, a couple days before Christmas with a six month history of dysphagia and a new distal esophageal gastric adenocarcinoma. Uh, his 90th birthday was the first week in January, okay? And he was, his past medical history was notable for the fact that he had never had an IV placed in his life because he'd never been ill at all in his life. And he and his daughter, who got special dispensation to accompany him to the visit, wanted to know what was the appropriate treatment plan for a stage three distal esophageal adenocarcinoma in someone a week before his 90th birthday and his quality of life and well-being and independence was the most important thing because he's the primary caregiver for his wife who has had a stroke. The fellow came out of the exam room, presented the case while Paolucci and his daughter waited, and the fellow described the cross data to me. That's the most recent relevant large randomized trial. For those of you, Rich knows this, he probably edited it as far as I know, but appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2012, and it included 368 patients with the median age of 60. And it involved six weeks of combined modality chemo radiation with carbotaxol, and the primary report of the trial, which the fellow printed out and handed to me, has no real breakdown by age. There is a forest plot, what is it called? Yeah, forest plot that shows, yeah, attenuated effect in the older folks, but it really, there's there's nobody over 80. So it's not, doesn't really help Paolucci's and his daughter's decision. So how do we use real world data in that context? The, the patient and his daughter say, okay, Dr. Schrag, is chemo radiation gonna work? Is it worth it? Or do we just make dad comfortable? Papa, comfortable. And what about the operation? What are the outcomes? And in fact, in that context, we can actually go to SEER data and figure out, we can look at people who are in their 80s and people who are in their 90s, I actually did both, who undergo esophagectomy and look at what the 90-day outcomes are, the one-year and the two-year outcomes, and really talk about it. And we can use real-world data to say, you know, the SEER data are great for that because we can figure out what the long-term outcomes are for 90-year-olds. And we had a conversation. The upshot is he never wants surgery. He never wants surgery. But we did have extensive conversations about short course versus long course chemo radiation. He's now in week two of the cross regimen. I don't have a lot of data, but um, we were able to bring to bear some EHR data on outcomes of octogenarians that we've treated with this disease and decided that in this man who was totally healthy otherwise, it was worth it because we could give his family some real world outcomes, not enough. And I had to say to them that we had no data for 90 year olds in our system, none. He was 89, but you know, so I think we can use it, but it's, it's challenging. Um, but I, I can tell you that they were very pleased to get some concrete estimates of our observational experience, far better than just the cross paper in the New England Journal. So, I, yeah. Well, thank, thanks, Deb. <laughs> it's a great example. Uh, but it, I think it illustrates more of the challenges than the solutions, quite honestly. Um, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> um, you know, we're going to run out of time very quickly here. I have a few other issues I want to try to drill into. And I'm going to start with a question for uh, Dr. Kanapuru um, about representativeness. So we've heard a lot in this whole meeting about representativeness. 
Uh, but I, I'm, I really like to get more specificity as to what that actually means, at least from the FDA point of view. You know, if, if you have a, a population of patients uh, with multiple myeloma, um, a certain percentage of those patients are going to be over 75, and a certain percentage of those are going to have renal dysfunction. Uh, and, uh, you know, the question is, it, should it be expected that the those same percentages that are found in real world practice are also found in clinical trial data? That seems like a pretty high bar to me. Uh, and so if, if that's not what you mean by representativeness, then what exactly do you mean? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I think that's a very um, you know, relevant question. Um, we certainly understand you know, that you, you, we're not expecting that the patient population on the clinical trials exactly mirror the numbers that we are seeing in the real world. Um, and as we have described in the inclusion of old adults uh, guidance, I think uh, our consideration about whether the trial population is representative or will you know, look into just not only the incidence in, in that patient population, but also you know, the um, anticipated um, activity of the drug as, and whether there is any difference that you would expect in the old adults based on um, the mechanism of the drug action or how it's metabolized. Uh, and so the representativeness, again, as was pointed out by one of our panelists, should not only look at just the absolute numbers, but also other aspects like whether these patients have the relevant comorbidities that the disease under consideration um, is, is, is known to have in the real world or uh, expected to have. So um, for, for some reasons, you know, uh, when we, we don't want to delay the um, for a lot of reasons, we don't want to delay the initial approval of the drug because just um, when you don't have um, a sufficient number of older adults, but there's enough evidence to say that this drug may work, but there's some residual uncertainty. So, and this is because often the trials may be smaller. So for example, you may have a 15% uh, representation of the older adults, but if your trial involves 100 patients, that's 15. Uh, patients. And so in that, you know, you, you obviously can't make definitive conclusions about the efficacy and safety in that old adult subgroup. And, you know, look at the, looking at the overall efficacy and if there's any anticipated, um, you know, differences in safety, at that point, the FDA may consider that additional data may be needed. So while it does not have to mirror the patient population exactly based on numbers, I think there are other considerations, including you know whether that whatever patient population is represented on the trial have the comorbidities or are representative of the patient population that is ultimately going to be treated. Um, and so I think we take into consideration all of these other aspects of the disease also before deciding when additional data is needed for that patient population. Well, thanks. Uh, you know, I, this is a question I think you know that I. I, I I've heard many sponsors um, uh, wish for more specificity about because, you know, in the example you gave, let's say you have a thousand patients in your trial, and 15% of the population uh, that uh, is intended to be treated, uh, you know, is 75 or older. Um, so, do you want 150, 75 and older patients uh, in the trial to be representative? And, you know, what if there's only 100? What if there's only 75? Um, you know, is there some threshold that should be exceeded uh, to declare that the population in the trial is sufficiently representative? I think the more, the more specific guidance FDA can give on these kinds of issues, the more helpful it will be to you know, sponsors of clinical trials, whether they're commercial sponsors or academic sponsors. Um, so um, I want to uh, go on and uh, and ask a question to Dawn. Um, you gave some really great examples, uh, Dawn, um, about um, SWOG's work uh, in um, you know, providing an evidence base for advocacy and policy change. Um, uh, I'm curious in, what, you know, in, in the approaches you've taken, if you have a mechanism in place to look at patient out-of-pocket costs uh, in clinical trials or other endpoints that are important to older patients, you know, like impact on independent functioning or 
impact of a of trial participation on caregiver burden. Um, are, are you sort of advancing the sophistication of your work uh, to, you know, to address some of those issues as well? Yeah, thank you for that question. I mean, we are addressing some of those those issues in prospective studies. You know, the one of the great things about this network that really reaches across the country and has so many different types of practices is that you can do both standard therapeutic interventional trials, but you can also, you know, use it as a resource to do observational studies as well. And we've done a lot on financial toxicity and we have a prospective study looking at financial navigation and caregiver burden, uh, as do several of the other groups. Um, and at the end of the day, I mean, I was thinking about this in terms of what was just being said is that our ability to trust any data source that we use is very much linked to our ability to control for confounding. So the better our data sources are at gathering information, you know, whether it be real world data or clinical trials data um, on issues that are relevant, such as functional status, performance status, other, you know, other types of out-of-pocket issues that can affect patients, you know, then the better, better we are at, at answering those, those questions, no matter what data source we use. We have, with our Medicare data, been able to look at issues related to costs and resource utilization in, in those kind of linked databases. Um, but more sophisticated linkages would help us answer those questions better, without a doubt. Thanks. Um, uh, yeah, I want to uh, turn to this issue about data missing this and maybe ask Bob and perhaps Neil uh, to comment, um, since you both have a lot of experience working with EHR data, um, you know, and, and I think both of you recognize full well that, you know, the EHR data is often incomplete for various reasons. Um, so sort of the, the, the simple question is, how are we going to fix that? Uh, you know, is it, <laughs> is it, do we need to redesign EHRs to make data entry simpler? Do we need to offer incentives to care teams to enter the relevant data, um, you know, what is the solution? Because it seems like, you know, just trying to curate, you know, data sets on millions of patients is not really going to be an effective strategy uh, going forward. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start, I guess. Uh, so, you know, yes to all of those things, Rich. Uh, we need to do all those things. You know, I, I think, um, well, there's no question that, that Using manual curation uh, is a necessary evil right now. It's expensive and unwieldy, but it's something that we have to do to get um, uh, important data elements out, particularly for uh, some of these some of these factors like stage and certain biomarkers. Um, and of course, there's technology solutions which we we don't really have time to go into. But again, those are to some extent those are band aids. But you know, I would I would submit that. Um, you know, while we often say that um, asking overburdened clinicians to do even more documentation um, is uh, is going to be challenging, I agree with that. But I don't think it's a cause for sometimes a nihilism that you hear. You know, I think um, a combination of more accessible data standards um, and um, you know, we we've been doing some work with the M Code Minimal Common Oncology Data Elements Initiative, uh, but identifying data elements that the clinicians are particularly well suited to enter into the electronic record because they have these downstream benefits. Um, I, I don't think that's, um, that's a lost cause. Uh, again, it's without um, either some degree of a regulatory stick uh, on top of that, it's not going to happen overnight. But I think that's some work that ASCO and many others in the space are doing. Um, but I, I think it's, it's really a matter of, of improving uh, the data entry at the outset uh, by maximizing the use of the electronic record and, and more importantly, uh, making sure that the, uh, the data entry is being done at the level of the license to use an expression that, that physicians are entering data when they have to for things that they are uh, uniquely capable of, of entering and um, other pieces of data should be brought forward throughout the electronic system. There needs to be an unbroken chain of, of, um, of data uh, from the source, uh, and that shouldn't necessarily be a clinician um, or, or a human being in every case. 
Thanks, Bob. I know we're just about at the end of our time, but maybe Neil, I'll ask you for a quick uh, comment since I'm sure you yeah, have. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll, I'm, an, I'm a glasses half full guy. So I'm going to be an optimist and hopefully not Pollyanna-ish. I think it's a given that you, if something doesn't fit within the workflow of the physician, they're not going to do it without being required to do it. However, oncologists really care about providing the best care to their patients. And if we move towards a goal of having more of a learning healthcare system across the United States, where data collected from electronic health records is used to inform care even at the point of care. And we heard this great example from Deb, I don't know how fictional it was, but this idea of, I just went into our data set to find out how this patient will do if I treat them uh, in such and such a way. A learning healthcare system, that's the whole point of it. Um, and if oncologists know that the data they enter is going to feed back to them and help them take better care of their patients, Okay. It could happen. Um, so that's my glasses half full ending comment. <laughs> All right. Well, a great way to close this session, uh, the search for the holy grail of the learning healthcare system. Um, so we are out of time, unfortunately. We had a few other questions teed up, but um, it will, we'll have to deal with those in another, uh, in another way. I want to thank uh, all the presenters and panelists for uh, great presentations and discussion on this really important topic. Uh, personally, I think that acquisition of data about uh, treating older patients in the post-market setting is probably going to emerge as the most important data source uh, to inform how we care for these individuals. I'm not personally that optimistic that we're ever going to get to a point in prospective clinical trials where we're going to have adequate representation, but there's huge um, opportunity in the post-market setting as was illustrated by uh, these terrific presentations. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to uh, Monica, I think, to uh, uh, call for a break. Uh, exactly, thank you, Rich, uh, very much. And thanks to all the speakers and discussants for this last session. Um, the workshop will, will resume at 11.50 a.m. And please be sure to tune back in because uh, session five is going to be a discussion of participant recommendations for the path forward. So uh, see you all in a few minutes.